So then why is crypto economics different from just regular old economics? Well, it's the environment. We live in a very different environment with the decentralization and trustlessness that makes economics a lot more difficult. We cannot um, rely on the outside law uh, enforcement that makes people uh, follow what we do. Instead, it's a very adversarial environment where, uh, where we only assume that people are rational, meaning that people maximize their own payoffs um, and do what's best for them. This is also what makes it very exciting, in my opinion. Where crypto economics really started was with the game theory of the Bitcoin protocol. Uh, so game theory is the study of strategic behavior or how you would respond to uh, situations in which other people also make decisions about how they behave. Um, importantly in this, in, for the Bitcoin protocol, is that you have a decision in which chain to mine. You could either main, mine on the longest chain or on another fork. And this decision is something that every miner actually has to make. And uh, you're incentivized to mine on the longest chain because uh, you'll get some uh, issuance rewards and fees. And if you mine on another chain and it's not included in the canonical chain, uh, you'll only uh, waste your uh, energy uh, spending on this, meaning that you're incentivized to do the right thing. Now, in game theory, we usually put these kind of games into uh, tables to make it easier for ourselves to see what's happening, what other players are doing, and how we can determine our own strategy. So as you can see here, assume that you're a Bitcoin miner uh, doubting to mine on the longest chain, what you're supposed to do, or on another chain for the next block. And all of the other miners we've aggregated into one group as well. And they're simultaneously deciding on their strategy as well. So uh, in this table, the first emoji corresponds to the utility or payoff of the person in the first column. So that's you as a miner. And the second emoji corresponds to what all of the other players are doing. And we can see that since all the other players are in this situation, uh, mining on the same chain, they'll always be happy as that chain will be the canonical chain. However, for you deciding on which chain to mine on, um, it's important to think about whether you're going to on the longest chain or on the other chain. And then how you could determine your strategy is to see, uh, given that other people are mining on the longest chain, what maximizes my payoff? Well, in this case, mining on the longest chain as well. And given that other player, players are mining on another chain, what max, maximizes my payoff? Well, mining on the other chain. So since every player in this situation has the same uh, strategy, we actually end up in a point where there's a steady state. Everyone mines on the same chain, hopefully. And this is the steady state uh, is what we call a Nash equilibrium because no one has a strict incentive to deviate from this, from this situation. So if you're mining on launch chain, if you mine on another chain, it means that your payoff will be less, meaning that, you're, um, meaning that you ha don't have an incentive to deviate. So this is uh, the game theory part of crypto economics, a small introduction. And uh, now we'll introduce a bit more theory called mechanism design. So mechanism design is really the study of designing strategic situations with game theory in mind. So how can we make games so that the payoff or the, the, the outcome is how we want it to be? Uh, an example could be uh, when we're designing an auction. We want people to uh, have, an, have an easy way to bid. So for example, bid their true valuation of something. Um, and we want that to be incentive compatible with the protocol. So incentive compatibility means that the, the designers have a goal in mind and the strategy that users are going to deploy um, reaches that goal. Um, so in that case, we could use game theory to see what's the strategy and how can we design around this. And it's always very important to take into account what you're actually designing for. So there have been some famous mistakes, for example, um, some game, uh, some Olympic games, where the, the pools weren't made correctly and some teams actually try, both try to lose, which is a very weird setting. Okay, so then if we turn back to our example of uh, the miners in Bitcoin, Bitcoin enforces that everyone mines on the longest chain, which is what the protocol wants them to do, by issuing rewards only for those mined on the longest chain. So this was a, a section about uh, game theory and mechanism design and a bit more theoretical setting. Later we'll dive more into applied settings, but if anyone has any suggestions, questions or anything, please just raise your hand. If not, we'll just continue to uh, how the gas market works. So many of you have probably have heard Vitalik's speech this morning. He talked a bit about the gas market, uh, and I'll try to elaborate a bit on that. So the gas market is basically uh, for any transaction that you send to Ethereum, you pay gas. And how this gas is constructed um, is dependent on the, the amount of operations and the type of operations that you do in the transaction. So each operation or opcode has a fixed amount of uh, gas units um, that are associated with it. So for example, multiplying two numbers costs five units of gas and adding two numbers costs three units of gas. And this, 
And this ratio is um, relatively defined, so 5-3 ratio, and this doesn't change. But this may be weird because, uh, as you may have noticed, the amount that you pay for your transactions isn't actually fixed. This is because the amount of ETH that you pay per gas unit, so these are two separate markets, um, is determined by supply and demand. It's important to have this distinction between the amount of gas units and the amount of ETH that you pay per gas unit. We have a gas limit to preserve decentralization, which is of course the goal uh, of the protocol. And this is done because if we could make the trade-off for a higher gas limit, so more gas units per block, um, and um, this means lower fees, more transactions, but it means less decentralization because less people would be able to participate in the protocol, less people would be able to validate, um, meaning that we miss one of the goals of decentralization. And how blocks are in principle made um, is that they, uh, a miner sees all of the transactions that come into the mempool and um, they choose the transactions that are pay the highest fee per gas unit and they basically just fill, the, fill, them, um, fill their block with the highest paid transactions. Again, the rationality assume, assumption that we talked about before. Important to note here as well is that this is the pre-ERP-1559 gas market. I'll talk a bit about this ERP later, um, but this is the simplest setting how it was before uh, some time ago in Ethereum. Um, then this actually, this auction for block space, so an auction in which we sell a scarce resource, which is block space, which is what the Ethereum protocol sells, is actually a first price auction. So players uh, bid for the transaction to be included, uh, and if they win the bid, uh, win the auction, they, they just pay their bid and they're included. Um, however, this is not an ideal setting because it's very difficult as a user to know what to bid exactly. If you bid your true valuation, you, you get your transaction in, but you also pay everything in gas fees, so you're not really better off. So you're going to shade a bit and going to bid a bit lower, 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 but you don't really know um, how much to bid. And it's also difficult for the protocol because in some cases, people that actually have more valuable transactions that were willing to bid more are not included, while people that have lower value transactions are included because it's difficult to determine your bidding strategy. How could we design an auction mechanism for Ethereum in which block space is sold in an incentive compatible manner so that people can just bid their true valuation uh, and do not have to worry about shading? We have second price auctions. In principle, these are very simple. Um, we are auctioning off the scarce resource again, block space, uh, and if you win an auction, um, you pay the second highest bid. So for example, if I bid 10, 10 ETH, you bid 14 ETH, and two other people bid 5 and 1 ETH, you win the auction with your 14 ETH bid, uh, but you only pay my bid of 10 ETH, uh, which is the second highest bid. And the nice thing about this property is that we can mathematically prove um, that in this case, it's dominant strategy incentive compatible. And this means that it, um, every person has a strategy independent of what other players are doing to simply bid their true valuation. This maximizes their utility, maximizes their payoff, and because every user is going to do this, we end up in the Nash equilibrium we talked about before. And this is actually great because now uh, we have a Nash equilibrium that we as a protocol want. Um, so why wouldn't we just implement um, the second price auction? This is an open question, so if anyone has a suggestion why we can't implement the second price auction in Ethereum. So you mean that you know that we, what everyone bids, um, so you can't implement the second price auction. Because, because then you can just bid yourself. Yeah, exactly. So because of the adversarial setting, miners will maximize their payoff. So let's say that you have a block in which there are four transactions, one paying 10 fees, eight fees, seven fees, and two fees. And we'll assume here that the second price um, version works in the case where you just pay the lowest um, transaction that's included in the block. Then every user will have to pay two fees if the, if the miner uses the real transactions. However, the miner can, um, in the adversarial setting, maximize their payoff by, using, uh, by stuffing the block with a known transaction. So they switch, switch out the transaction paying two fees, insert one of six, and now three people pay six in fees instead of um, four people paying eight, meaning that they maximize their payoff. And this is something that can be easily done by a miner and is very difficult to detect. Um, therefore, we can't implement these kind of uh, mechanisms, um, which is unfortunate because as we have seen, there are quite a few negative uh, consequences of first price auctions. For example, the priority gas auction, or PGA for short. This means that if there's a very valuable uh, block space, you may want to have your transaction included before other players. So for example, if there is an NFT minting and there's only one NFT, you want to be the first one to uh, mint this NFT, but other players may, may also want to mint it. So let's say this NFT is worth uh, 100 ETH, 
you're willing to pay up to 100 even gas fees. But of course, you want to shade your bid as much as possible and pay as little uh, as possible. And that's what we see here. On the y-axis, we see gas bids in gray. And, in the y oh, sorry. and on the x-axis, we see uh, time. And the, the orange triangles are bids by one uh, bot who is searching uh, through Ethereum, seeing if there are valuable transactions they want to bid for. And the blue uh, is a similar bot, but just a different one. On the green star, we see where um, the, bot had, the bot that won, and the red uh, bot is the bot that lost. And you see that the bids are increasing over time, um, outbidding each other iteratively by small amounts uh, to maximize their payoff. And now, why this is exactly bad for the protocol is because um, it spams the mempool. Um, it makes sure that even transactions that don't win, so transactions that aren't the green one, are also included in the block because they pay a lot of gas fees, so miners are uh, incentivized to include them in the block meaning that the block is filled up with transactions that revert, they do nothing, and they basically only waste uh, block space. And since block space is now more scarce, base fees or uh, gas fees go up, uh, which is bad for everyone, of course. So an elegant, elegant solution that was thought of uh, for this is ERP-1559, as I spoke about before. And basically what this does is it transforms the fee market into something that resembles more of a second price auction. So now, uh, up until ERP-1559, you just pay uh, the gas fees, and those go to the, the block builder, uh, and they, um, they can put all of their profits in the pocket. But now um, there's a base fee that's determined by the protocol and uh, an amount that you give to the block builder, and this base fee is burnt, so there's no uh, incentive for people to try and uh, make off-chain agreements, uh, giving you part of the base fee. Um, and this, this makes the... Uh, bidding for block space very different because now blocks in general aren't full, so miners are just incentivized to include whichever transaction uh, pays them enough tip to be included. Um, so bidding is a lot, has become a lot easier. You basically just pay the ba uh, base fee, you add a very small amount of gray that's uh, constant over time, and this means that your strategy of bidding is basically incentive compatible with how the protocol wants you to do. So it resembles kind of a second price auction. Um, and you can just bid their true value. And also, um, it's a common mis misconception that ERP-1559 decreases uh, total fees or gas fees that users pay. And this is not the case because it's only a mechanism of how users bid for their transactions to be included. The block space in the long run is not, uh, is not increased, meaning that gas fees don't um, decrease because the supply and demand are still the same. So that was the part about gas fees. Um, if anyone has a question, ERP-1459 is quite interesting, so um, I'd be happy to take anything. But otherwise, we'll just continue with maximum extractable value, which is also a very interesting subject. Um, it's a subject which has a lot of applications, and there, uh, there are many papers written about this, so it's definitely worth checking out. But we'll give a brief introduction to it. So maximum extractable value means that you extract as much value as you can from the Ethereum network. So how this is done is we'll start by looking at how transactions come into the block. As we talked about before, users submit their transactions and they're included in the mempool at first, in which all uh, block builders, uh, searchers, uh, searchers or people who extract MEV uh, can, can look uh, and they try to maximize their own payoff. Um, so for example, if you submit a transaction to the mempool trading uh, token A for token B, uh, and it's a very large trade, the price of this pair is going to switch. So as someone searching through the mempool, you could think that um, this, this is going to happen, you know it's going to happen. So in that case, uh, I'll bid, um, place a transaction just before this in the block so that um, I, I can buy token B before it increases in price, meaning that I have an arbitrage, so risk-free uh, profit. Uh, and this is what happens a lot. And why this is possible is because um, the ordering in a block is not fixed. It, it's not the case that if you submit your transaction, it's included in the, in the block on, on a time basis. Anyone can um, can shift the order, or actually builders can shift the order, or if some, someone is willing to pay for it, they can shift the order as well, uh, meaning that they could extract any value from users in the Ethereum network. So interestingly about this, um, this is very similar in, in, in some sense to high frequency trading in uh, traditional finance. In the blockchain, the difference is that you can actually um, execute these strategies atomically, 
meaning that if you have uh, one transaction in, in the mempool that you would like to um, do some MEV on, you can include your transactions only if they're profitable. So in this case, there is really no way to lose money. So this all sounds very bad. Users are being value attracted. Uh, it makes execution worse for users. Why wouldn't we just forbid MEV? Well, it's not as simple. MEV is a quite powerful force. So we'll have a look at why uh, some people think MEV is good and why some people think MEV is bad. So on the one hand, people argue that MEV is bad because searchers, um, searchers find almost all transactions in the, in the mempool that they can do MEV on. And they make sure that your execution is as bad as possible which is, of course, not something that you like. Um, also, interestingly, MEV incentivizes centralization. This is, uh, again, if we walk back to the comparison with high-frequency trading in traditional finance, these are usually corporations with multi-billion dollar budgets. They have very big uh, infrastructure operations. And some similar argument can be made for MEV. Um, you, need, uh, you need to stand the mempool. There are multiple strategies that require high investments, meaning that there is economies to scale, um, which is a centralizing force, which of course is not something which you want. And it's actually been quoted as one of the threats to Ethereum. Um, search is waste blood space. This is what we saw before uh, in the priority gas auctions, um, where transactions that are reverted or do nothing are included, um, pushing up gas prices. And MEV searches are generally very smart. So they could put their time and efforts into building other great projects that uh, contribute to the ecosystem. Um, but some people argue that this is very bad. On the other hand, um, there's an argument to may be made that MEV is good, or maybe this is a bit unnuanced. MEV might not be extremely good, but it's worth extracting, or um, the way to deal with MEV is not to just ignore it. Um, there's an argument that some searches provide very valuable um, very valuable um, services to the, the network. For example, if there are two liquidity pools and in the one pool, um, token A and B are trading for, um, well, you can get five token B for one token A, and then the other pool, you can get 10 token B for one token A. This is, of course, a mismatch. And searchers, um, they can do an arbitrage transaction here, making the prices, again, uh, equal so that um, users in general have better execution if they trade in one of these pools randomly. Um, also liquidations um, for lending platforms. If there's bad debt, uh, searchers liquidate and the, the, um, the people that lend out the money uh, are protected. And these are generally recognized as quite good um, parts of MEV. Uh, MEV can be redistributed. So it's an interesting line of research where um, the idea is that you extract all of the MEV, but then the MEV is redistributed to users. For example, as a user, if you submit a large transaction that's going to shift prices, you could make an agreement with someone that's going to extract from you. Let's say they make um, one ETH profit by extracting from you. You could get an agreement saying that, okay, you have to pay me back at least 90% or something of this extraction, uh, and then, then it's fine. So in this case, MEV wouldn't be as toxic as it would be normally. And another uh, big argument is that MEV needs to be attracted to ensure protocol safety. There are quite some uh, proposals to ensure protocol safety by other means, um, but the extraction and redistribution seems like an argument which is very holistic, uh, meaning that users uh, are, don't fall through the cracks. And there are no incentives to uh, be very quick or not. Okay, so it's very difficult to say whether MEV is actually very good or if it's particularly bad. Uh, it's easy to say that MEV cannot be ignored. Um, why, it's not, um, why it's not really settled is because there are lots of nuances as well. For example, some backruns that we talked about before that make sure that prices in liquidity pools are equal are seen as bad. For example, if you have lots of transactions trading uh, ETH for Bitcoin and Bitcoin for ETH and uh, the other way around, you can um, first align all of the transactions trading ETH for Bitcoin and then backrun um, by bas basically first having all of the users pay up the price and then taking a free arbitrage profits, which would be seen as a bad backrun. Um, so not all MEV can be detected, um, and not all MEV can be easily classified into good or bad, meaning that it's not as easy to say that we should uh, do particular things with it. However, there are things to be done. So some responsibility lies with DAP developers. Um, you could design your DAPs with for example, mechanism design and game theory in mind, such that your users aren't extracted from too much. Um, 
this is something that's very important and is an increasing line of research. And um, we can't say that all of the responsibility lies with DAP developers because um, some MEV cannot be mitigated by only one DAP. It's a, trans a contribution of multiple factors, multiple transactions that may be unrelated, meaning that there is also a role for the protocol um, to make sure that users aren't extracted too much from. And now we'll be going a bit into ongoing research that we do at the EF, uh, at the Robust Incentives Group. Uh, so I'd also like to invite Barnabé for this. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, do let us know. And otherwise, we'll be happy to talk about what we do. We do basically crypto economic research on the foundation of uh, the assumptions that we talked about earlier. Um, so are there any questions about what we've talked about up to now? I think MEV, is, it's also irrespective of um, sharding in some sense. So there are, for example, uh, cross-domain MEV opportunities that don't simply disappear because of sharding. Um, so no, I don't think it would disappear. I guess it could be mitigated somehow if most of the uh, user transactions move to like rollups and rollups are the ones who use the data sharding facilities that we are now building at protocol level. Uh, in that case, most of the MEV maybe accumulates at, proto at the rollup level and you might not see so much of it at the base layer of Ethereum. But yeah, as Julian said, because rollups don't just live in their single world, for instance, you have designs for pooled liquidity where different rollups could use the same liquidity that resides at the base layer or at some settlement layer. You could see that some of the MEV sort of percolates down to where the liquidity is. So many people, I think, are trying to build models, including us. So rollup economics is something that we're trying to think about to, to see how the value flows from the users to the protocols to protocols which are on top of Ethereum. Um, and MEV is, is a part of it, yeah. So maybe I'll explain what the sandwich attack is in general. Um, so um, if, if, there's a, if there's a transaction moving prices, you can put your transaction in front and the transaction in, uh, at the back, so back running, um, and profiting at both sides. And in this case, you have a transaction in between two of your transactions, which makes it a sandwich, um, which is seen in general, I think, as a toxic form of MEV. Um, yeah, also in traditional finance, it's a difficult argument, I think. Uh, it's not as nuanced that um, well, market making isn't, yeah, it's, it's not um, as atomic arbitrage as it's here. Like you have a 100% chance of making money, and if it's not profitable, you simply let your transaction not execute. Um, but it, there are quite some parallels to be made between MEV and high frequency trading in traditional finance. Yeah. Traditional finance, when you see high frequency trading, a lot of value goes to, I don't know, putting your computer next to the New York Stock Exchange or billions of dollars to shave off nanoseconds to, to your strategies. This is economic value that just leaves the market and goes towards people who build all this infrastructure. Maybe one of the opportunities that we have with the protocol with respect to MEV is if it can be captured and if it can be captured efficiently, that this value could serve to strengthen protocol security rather than hamper it. So of course, it doesn't mean that, yeah, let's get user sandwich because that gives us more value for protocol safety. I think, of course, like we should design dApps such that these bad outcomes don't happen. So for sandwiches specifically, there's many different proposals that I would say realize different trade-offs that users might have. So just mentioning some of the top of my head, one is encryption. So your transaction could go encrypted, be committed to, and then executed. So people can sandwich you because you don't know what happens. The trade-off here, of course, is that the execution latency is a bit higher, but maybe as a user, you're fine with this. Uh, another idea is um, receive time ordering consensus. So there's this idea that you know, if transaction A is seen by most of the network before transaction B, then transaction A should be included in the block before transaction B. It's, in theory, I think a property that is really nice. But again, because we're in a decentralized system, there's no one that reports, oh, I've seen A before B, so A must be before B. And again, you can have these games of, of collocation. So again, trade-offs here as well. Another thing that I would say is a relatively new idea is the idea of offering your order flow, so getting paid for your transaction, saying, well, if my transaction is so valuable to you, you should pay for it. That's what Julian also introduced earlier. Uh, I hope that we'll see more protocols in that direction because these are the ones, in my opinion, that make the users whole and also allow the protocol to, to capture some of that um, MEV. 
I, I don't want to comment on Flashbots specifically because I'm not working for Flashbots, but I would say Flashbots, other people in this ecosystem are trying to understand MEV from first principle, where it comes from. The view, of course, is to, to use it as a force for good, so trying to ensure that it doesn't destabilize the protocol, that it doesn't hurt the users. Um, yeah, so part of that comes from mitigating it if it's bad. Part of it comes from containing it and maybe capturing it if it's good. Uh, yeah, I would say these are broad strokes of the ecosystem. But yeah, yeah sure. Um, so multidimensional task fees is very different from MEV. Uh, it's not related. It means that um, now we pay gas for any kind of operation that you do, whether you store something on the blockchain or whether you do um, just simple operations like uh, multiplying. Um, we all cram this cost of computation and cost of storage into one unit, which we call gas. But we could split this up into multiple units um, so that you pay for pay more directly for what you use. So if you're, if you're trying to store things, you pay for what that you store and you don't congest the block, blockchain with... Um, so in this case, the gas limit is set so that um, people aren't, their computers aren't overwhelmed. But for example, if you have um, lots of transactions only using one particular thing, like if there are only transactions using storage, there's lots of um, operations that could still be executed by people. And so in this case, multidimensional gas would mean that um, these computers are used more efficiently, basically, and there are more transactions could be executed. Yeah, adding to this, uh, if you've heard about rollups, so the idea of rollups is there chains that exist outside of the Ethereum base layer. These chains, to secure themselves with Ethereum, they have to post data to the Ethereum base layer, basically the kind of summary of what happened on the chain. So this data is not executed, so it doesn't add execution to or execution cost to the base layer, but it needs to be made available and stored. For instance, these are two separate types of resources. Um, probably, if you've heard of EIP 4844, the, the idea of providing a much greater data capacity at the Ethereum base layer is separating the market between the Ethereum execution and the market for data that rollups are posting. In that case, you would have something like two base fees, or you would have the way to differentiate between two markets. Okay, so what we are per personally working on uh, is, for example, MEV, multidimensional gas, proposed builder separation, Brian Bates just gave a talk about, uh, and I've worked a bit on uh, block space derivatives, so ensuring that people can hedge against gas fees rising in the future. Um, yeah, if you'd like to talk about that, uh, please find us. Yeah, and I would say crypto economics is relatively new as a field. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't have traditional economics background or even computer science background who get interested in it. So, yeah, the barrier to entry feels a little lower, mostly because there's a lot of resources now that are available. If you go into the DEF CON video archive, there's lots of talks on crypto economics that are interesting. And, yeah, if you, if you think it's fun, I think both Julian and me would be also happy to answer questions offline. Talking about resources, we compiled a list. Um, so in the table, there are some uh, collectives or groups that publish resor uh, research on crypto economics. Uh, and in the bottom, there are some links to some personal uh, blogs from people, uh, including Barnabé, about some uh, crypto economic research. Uh, the slide should also be made available later. Um, yeah. So that was it. That was it. Uh, we ended a bit early. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free. Uh, but thank you very much, very much for attending. Uh, and you can always also ask your questions uh, later if you'd like. I want to give special thanks to Julian because he didn't know he was going to do this talk three days ago. And I think he did a really wonderful job. So if you can applaud him again. Yeah.